Okay, welcome everybody to our uh, MyNet education session on the perils of predatory journals. Uh, for those of you who are new to these sessions, I'm Orgy Jingwal. And I'm Maureen Bass. And we're the librarians with MyNet. So you should be able to see both uh, Maureen and I on your screen and also uh, our slides. And so our objectives today are just to make sure that you are aware of the services that we offer through MyNet, to describe the history and nature of predatory journals and publishers, to demonstrate the problems that arise from the use of these journals, to establish how to avoid these journals, and to learn, um, we're going to conclude with learning about fake news and, um, and how to identify it. Okay. You're not coming up on my screen. We can go to audience view and have a look. Sorry, we've just got a comment that uh, audience view up top. Um, oh, yeah, sometimes it doesn't show that. Okay. Okay. Um, so we just had a comment that some people are not able to see us. That's okay. Um, that really just kind of a bonus kind of thing. It's really the slides that are important. That's the bonus of us. <laughs> Some people faces. are able to see us, so I'm not, um, if you really want to see us, you can always log out and log back in. Um, sometimes that corrects it. Uh, otherwise, we'll just kind of, we'll, we'll just continue. Keep going. So MyNet is Manitoba's Health Information and Knowledge Network. We're a service that is to staff at Manitoba Health to all fee-for-service physicians in the province of Manitoba and to staff of participating uh, regional health authorities. There are currently four of us on the team, Maureen and I and one other librarian, Gail, and uh, the real mastermind behind it all is Cheryl, who um, she fills all your articles. If you have problems, she's usually your first line of contact and she managed your registration for you. Um, so everybody, uh, if you don't have a library card, please make sure that you sign up for one. You can go to mynet.ca and uh, the, the form is there. Uh, and we have four primary services. The first are literature searches. So we are happy to do searches for you on any topic, anytime you need it. We can then send you the full text of articles. So if you like to do your own searching or if you ever come across an article and um, particularly if you've uh, been somewhere on Google or um, if somebody told you about an article, never pay for your own articles. Just send us the citation and we will send you the full text article. We can also set up a weekly current awareness where you let us know your favorite journals or topics or authors or whatever your favorite kinds of things are. And then on a weekly basis, you'll get an email with all of the new publications um, meeting that criteria. The fourth thing we do is training sessions like this. So we've, um, this is our first fall series. We did a series in the summer, fall series, and we've just and we announced sent it to it. We have just announced the winter session, so uh, that's... So we have new sessions, up. and we're also always happy to do one-on-one -on -one sessions. If you have a group of people who are going to be meeting and you'd like us to talk about something, yeah. uh, we can do customized sessions as well. Um, so we have lots of opportunities. We're happy to come and, uh, and present. So we're going to just get you started with a poll here. Um, and we're going to ask how many of you have uh, heard of predatory journals before. So um, we'll just set that up. And uh, all right. So we've launched the poll. We're going to leave it open for a while. If you could please respond to that, that would be great. Right. I'm just watching the results come in. <laughs> few, of time. A few more are yet to vote. Yeah. So, 94% voted. Okay. Good. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, the vast majority of you have heard of them, but you don't really know what they are. So that's that's good. We're going to uh, we're going to cover what they are um, at this point. So uh, to get started, predatory publishers and journals um, are those that mimic academic journals, um, but they don't have the editorial review and publishing services that are associated with legitimate scholarly journals. Um, 
And so we're just going to give a a short. Oh, this Orvi, this is your, still your section. Uh -oh. Sorry, I've uh -oh. just like <laughs> butted into <laughs> presenter chaos. That's um, okay. Um, so what used to happen um, when journals were in print is that nobody, there was no business model to m create a fake journal. Um, it just didn't make any sense to manage it's all that paper. Of money. <laughs> and it's a lot of money to actually print something and then distribute it in mail. What happened as, oh yeah, we've, <laughs> we've got some nice got examples. Some, got some journals. Um, Not the cheapest. What happened then uh, w with the evolution of open access? So this is when research is made freely available. And the big driver for this, um, and one that we're big advocates for is, when you have governments, um, the public dollars through governments funding research, often by publicly funded researchers, like in academic institutions, um, so often what would happen would be that, that the results from that publicly funded research would not be available to everybody. And so the big driver for open access with the internet was to make these things freely available. Um, and what many people don't understand is that there's still a lot of money involved in that uh, putting things online is a lot less expensive than having print, but it still costs money to have a server and to have a secure interface and to pay editors and to, um, um, and copy editors. So there are still costs, real costs involved in electronic publishing. But uh, in 2010, Jeffrey Beal coined the term of predatory publishing because what some people would do would just be to create a website, which doesn't really cost very much money at all, doesn't take a lot of effort. You can, Maureen, you know, Maureen can set one up in an hour. Maureen can build you one in an hour. Might take me two or three. Uh, and uh, then they would claim to be a real journal. And that's what we're going to talk about mm -hmm. um, for the rest of the session. Okay. So now, really, it's Maureen's turn. <laughs> All yeah. right. For real this time. Um, so we're just going to talk. Oops, just going to talk about the nature of predatory journals. Um, so peer review, uh, or rather, the nature of scholarly journals. Mm -hmm. um, so a legitimate scholarly journal will probably involve a peer review process. So that's when you send your manuscript in, and people have a look at it. And like experts, it's sent to experts in the field, and they, they provide really meaningful feedback um, on the topic and decide whether or not the article will be accepted or suggest revisions or sources that need to be included, anything like that. This is a time-consuming and detail-oriented process. Um, and many predatory journals will claim to undertake peer review. Um, and they'll often make claims of, of a rapid review process. Um, and acceptance can be within a week or within a day, which, you know, or, or even within a couple of hours, and that's not possible. Um, it's, it's, it doesn't make any sense. So they're, they're claiming peer review when, in fact, they're not providing any peer review. So they're, they're charging for this, and they're, they're presenting it as a, a great thing about their journal, and it's a lie. Um, so one of the, as we go through this presentation, we'll be talking about sort of red flags to pay attention to for if, if you're ever encountering a journal and you're not sure if it's a legitimate journal or not. Um, anything that's promising a rapid peer review process, I'd, I'd take another look at. Um, so what about the quality of articles that exist in the journals? Because you know, just because something hasn't gone through peer review doesn't mean it's necessarily complete garbage. Yeah. Um, and throughout the history of, of predatory journals, the awareness of them, there have been a, a number of sting operations. Uh, so there was one recently where uh, the iOS, the, the iPhone operating system, you know how if you push the keys on your phone, you can just predictive text spell out a, a an entire sentence or an entire paper, as the case may be. Somebody wrote a paper on nuclear physics uh, by just typing nuclear reactor and then just going from there. And it was accepted at several in several peer review or in several peer-reviewed predatory journals. Um, I just recently read one where a dog was appointed to seven editorial boards. <laughs> so that's 
That's great. Um, there have been a number of these sting operations, but of course that's not the majority of what people are sending off to these journals. Most people aren't sending off uh, papers that have been written by their phone. Um, but one of the most famous sting operations was this Bohannon sting, um, in which he put together a paper that he, he modified each time he sent it off. Um, but it was, you know, it looked like a legitimate scholarly article. And uh, he, but it was, it was one of those ones that any legitimate peer review would have caught issues with it and rejected it. There were major methodological concerns. It was uh, like it claimed too much based on its findings. Its sample size was too small. You know, it, it would not have been accepted. Um, so he sent it off to 304 different open access journals um, and over half of those journals accepted this publication. Um, now this happened in 2013, I believe, and led to a meaningful change in the DOAJ, which is the Directory of Open Access Journals, which is a listing of, of open access journals. And it really wants to be a listing of legitimate open access journals. So they saw the results of this, realized that clearly there was some problem, and went through and, and changed their, you know, to be accepted here, here's the things that you have to show us that you're doing. Um, so many journals were removed from the Directory of Open Access Journals, um, and, and it's now a much, much better listing of, of legitimate open access journals. Um, and again, we'd like to reiterate that there are legitimate open access journals, and that you shouldn't be wary of open access journals in general. Um, so, but again, this, this sting operation falls into the same problem in that it's, it's a sting operation. You're sending off a deliberately bad article um, and, and showing that the journal doesn't necessarily go through the proper editorial steps to make sure that it's not accepting bad articles. But usually people are going to be submitting articles that they actually care about, that they've actually written well, uh, or what they think is well to these, to these journals. Um, and so there haven't been very many studies done on the content in predatory journals, but the ones that have been done have suggested that, unfortunately, most of the articles in them are not spectacular. Okay. Um, so I'll just take over the entire screen since already stuck down. Um, there was a recent assessment of content in predatory nursing journals um, that looked at just a whole ton of them. And at a glance, they looked like genuine articles. They were structured properly. They had all the methodological steps that were needed. Um, but when you looked more closely, there was flawed research design. The findings and the study itself was poor or average quality. Plagiarized content was con uh, common. It existed in almost half of the papers. Um, so, you know, that gives you a real sense that, that nothing was, was very good. There were less than 5% uh, like, well -quali like high quality articles. Um, and then there was another study more recently uh, that suggested that the articles in them typically display either bad methodology or bad reporting of their studies, and it was unable, like the author was unable to determine whether it was bad reporting or bad methods because there wasn't enough information in the article to make that judgment, which of course a study should be reproducible. You should be able to tell right away whether the problem is in the, the methods or in the way they're interpreting the findings or, or anything like that. So that sort of gives you a sense of what predatory journals are. They're, they're, they'll accept basically anything, what is in there, even if it's intended to be good, isn't necessarily. Um, this isn't to say that there aren't good quality articles in there. The same study that looked at the nursing journals found that there were a handful, a very small handful, but still a handful, of quite good quality articles in these journals. And it's unfortunate that they chose this, this particular venue to publish these articles that would have been accepted. Um, in more legitimate scholarly journals. Uh, there's also a subspecies of predatory journals that are known as hijack journals. And these ones are, if anything, uh, 
more disreputable and, and more actively predatory than predatory journals as a whole. Because what they're doing is they're mimicking existing journals. So um, Beale's List, we talked about Jeffrey Beale who named predatory publishers before. Uh, he put together a list which is, is now um, no, no longer maintained, but it's mirrored at several sites on the internet so you can still see what journals there were that fell into this category. Um, but it's not being updated anymore. But one of the listings on there was this hijack journals. And so this is just a section of that that I'm showing you here on the slide. And you can see on, uh, on one side I've got the hijack journals and on the other side I've got the authentic journals. Um, and some of them, you know, they're very similar names. Uh, the hijack journal is the JNCC report and then the authentic journal is the JNCC report series. Some of them are even the same, the Journal of Technology and the Journal of Technology. Um, and you'll notice one of them near the bottom, uh, which is in, I believe, German, so I'm not going to try and read it because I do not speak German. Um, it, it's in black there on the authentic side, and that's because the authentic journal, the real journal, doesn't have a website. So the only website that you would come across for that journal is the hijack journal. Um, so if you were looking to submit and you didn't realize that you had to submit, I, I presume, through mail, um, well, you'd come across this one and be like, oh, I can submit online and I'll do that and it'll be great. Um, but you would be submitting to an illegitimate publication um, that's pretending to be something that it's not. And so I've just got a sample here. We've got a hijack journal, Arctic Journal, and the authentic journal, also Arctic Journal. Um, and so the authentic journal, you can, like, I don't know how big this is or how much you can see it, but the, other, the authentic journal talks about its scope and its, you know, Arctic science, Arctic studies, anything to do with the Arctic. Whereas the hijack journal, it talks about, quote, of it, it publishes material on various fields of science and technology. So that's, that's another one of those red flags. This is a very broad scope. Um, but you want to be careful. Like, the, the page for the Arctic Journal Hijack Journal looks like, I mean, it looks pretty decent. And I've just circled here. You can see they've got listings of stats. And maybe you can't read them directly, but they're, they're showing the ISSN, the impact factor of the journal, where it's, uh, where it's indexed, so what databases it's in, and this sort of thing. Now, that's all valid information. Arctic Journal is indexed in this. Arctic Journal does have an ISSN, but it's the real Arctic Journal, not the one that they're showing on, like not, not this hijacked journal. So if, you, if you're ever not sure about a journal and you're like, oh, well, it says it's indexed in, in uh, Biosys Previews and you decide to go see, well, does Biosys Previews, does it have a link to to, or does it, does it actually index Arctic Journal? Okay, great. Take it the next step, follow the link. Is it the website that you were looking at before? Um, so that's... And I'll just um, add a reminder uh, in case um, this is anybody's first time to our series. Uh, after we do the session, we'll be sending out the slides because we know yeah. that some of this information, um, it's just meant to give you an idea where it, yeah. it gets really tiny, but we will provide the slides so that you can see. Yes, and we'll be uh, providing you with a handout as well that, uh, that deals with a lot of these assessment criteria that we're talking about mm -hmm. um, and uh, something else that Orvi will be talking about later in the presentation. Um, so, but to continue just to talk about the, the quality of this, this hijack journal, well, here's the, uh, the top article that was there on the day that I made these slides. I, I have not made any typos in my copying it from the journal, so you've got the effect of the nutrient concentrate in ration to performance of local chickens, which A, sounds like a very legitimate article title, and B, <laughs> absolutely, <laughs> um, sounds like it's related to the Arctic. Um, so, you know, just, just to give you a sense. Now, again, not all the articles in there are, are going to be of this um, preposterous nature. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good way to word it. Um, now, so just sort of moving on from, from hijacked journals, uh, there's also been an increasing uh, problem of predatory conferences. 
Now these are these will be sending out invitations to your email. Come join us at this presentation. Come talk to us at the like. Come talk at this presentation. They often claim keynotes and other presenters, other speakers that won't actually attend and may not even know that they've been invited or named. Um, they often charge exorbitant fees and they're often held in hotels alongside several other conferences at the same time. So there will be, you know, 30 conferences going on and each conference will take maybe approximately an hour. Um, and there's Which for those of you who have been to real conferences, <laughs> usually they're at least two full days. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I've been to ones that are one day, but yeah. yeah. Um, and you know, and then people will complain like, oh, the catering is crap too, and this sort of thing. Yeah. So, um, but this is something to be aware of. So if you're receiving invitations to conferences, uh, make an effort to see if it's valid, see if anybody you know has gone to it. If there's a speaker that you want to see there, and they're claiming they have this speaker, maybe email the speaker or check the speaker's website to see if they talk about that they're going to be attending this. Um, and on the nature of emails, uh, so they'll, predatory publishers, they won't only email you to invite you to, to conferences, they will email you to join the editorial board. Here you can see something Set, that was sent to me, dear Dr. or dear M. Maureen, warm greetings. And then dot, a, dot, dot. Yeah. <laughs> and then an invitation to join the Journal of Nursing Sciences editorial board, which, you know, I'm absolutely qualified for as a librarian. <laughs> um, I've got another one, honorable Dr. Maureen Babb with my doctorate that I definitely have. Um, for that, <laughs> just to be very clear, she's using a lot of sarcasm. <laughs> yes, I do not have a doctorate. <laughs> I'm not qualified to be on a nursing tutorial <laughs> or like not even remotely. Um, and so this one's actually very interesting because it's it's we will review the manuscript with high profile resources or researchers, and we will publish your manuscript in 12 to 16 days. There's that peer review speed thing that we were talking about. Also, I think I got this in uh, um, at the beginning of November. So they're asking for a submission deadline of November 7th. So, you know, that's the standard. Reasonable timeline. Yeah. And, and some of these, I know again, you, you know, scroll through, because she's got this yeah. whole collection of these them. These are delightful. Dr. Maureen Babb, Dr. Babb. And some of them you can tell from the outside. It's like some of the email scans you get. You can tell by the language of the writing that it is just junk and it's mm -hmm. it's clearly some kind of scam. There are other ones, like Maureen was indicating, with the hijacked ones, um, or with just kind of a good yeah a good predatory journal where that won't always be the case. But like with any of your email, if you know the sentences aren't constructed properly or mm -hmm. if it's just not you know dear honorable and Maureen. Um, you know, just, just hit delete right away. Mm -hmm. And I'd like to bring your attention to this last one that I've pulled up here, um, because they're, they're listing all these impact factors, scientific journal impact factor, index Copernicus impact factor. These are made up and meaningless values. Um, there are actually companies that create fake impact factors for these fake journals so that people will be impressed. Oh, really? Yeah. Oh my gosh. <laughs> um, so the real question is, well, who publishes in these journals? Um, well, there are the people who have been tricked. So often newer researchers or, or um, yeah, uh, just, just people who, for whatever reason, were fooled by the... And sometimes, too, it's a, it's a, a lack of um, knowledge in the mm -hmm. discipline. So if somebody usually publishes in one discipline but does have a research project that is multidisciplinary or um, sometimes librarians do publish in nursing journals, yep. for example. That's why I keep getting all those nursing ones because I have published in nursing journals. And uh, so sometimes then if people just aren't super familiar with where, they're, mm -hmm. where they should be publishing, um, then that's how they yeah. potentially could be tricked. Yeah, and if you're concerned about that, um, there are tools that exist and we can certainly help you select journals that will not be predatory uh, to publish it. 
Um, and then there are those who publish knowingly, and there, there are a variety of reasons why they might do that. So they might do it for speed. They just need to get those results out there for whatever reason or they need to game the system. They're coming up for tenure, uh, they know they need more publications on there, um, they're going to bank that nobody's going to check the journal that they're looking at and just yeah. add this publication. The same with the job applications. Yes, job too. applications, any of that sort of, you know, getting ahead professionally sort of thing. Um, in some cases it might be that they know that their work isn't of a quality that would be accepted by an authentic journal and for whatever reason they don't want to up their game enough to do that. Um, or it could, oh, I thought I removed that part. Well, it could be for people with uh, political or financial motivations, which, and each, some of these we'll talk about in more detail as we carry on. Um, so one of the things that's important to note is that this is a worldwide problem. Uh, there's been a little bit of rhetoric in the past that most of the people who publish in these journals are from developing nations or, um, or areas where where scholarship is, you know, mainstream scholarship is relatively new, and this is not true. Um, the the country that publishes the most in these journals is India, and then the second highest rate of publication in these journals is the United States, and it's not just brand new universities of of dubious quality that are publishing in these journals. Um, people from Harvard, for example, have published in these journals. And established, uh, established scholars have published in these journals as well. So this is a major concern and something to, to pay attention to. Um, so why are they a problem? Well, you've got a polluting of the literature. Um, you've got scholars with dubious credentials getting promoted, getting tenure. Um, you've got, there's potential for damage to the reputation of, if you accidentally, if one of us accidentally publishes in one of these journals, it'd probably be even worse for us, because as a librarian, <laughs> that's we should know better. <laughs> um, but, uh, so it can damage your reputation or your institution's reputation if you're publishing in these journals or if you're citing in them. Um, and then, again, I thought I removed that. It's okay. Um, there could be political and financial motivations. So. There hasn't been a great deal of, of detailed study of predatory journals. Most of the papers written about them have been small-scale studies or articles, uh, or editorials, rather. Um, so the example that I'm going to use for the polluting of the literature is uh, related to the case of freshwater ichthyology in India, which I'm aware is not medical in topic. But uh, so um, freshwater ichthyology uh, involves a lot of taxonomy, so naming of fishes, and uh, and making it very clear, well, this fish exists here in this area, this fish exists here in this area, here's a subspecies of this fish, and etc. I don't know all the details, I am not an ichthyologist. Um, but apparently there's been a real problem where because you get more media attention, because you get more, uh, you're more likely to be promoted, um, and this sort of thing, if you've discovered a new species of fish, there are people rediscovering old species of fish or saying that this fish, which is some other fish, they're just giving it a new name and then they're publishing it in these, these ichthyology journals. And then this is causing a problem where, um, especially if it's published in, in a compilation or a book or something like that, where people just cite it without realizing that, oh no, this fish and this fish are the same and they're just there, so it's, it's really causing a problem in freshwater ichthyology in India um, uh, to the extent where, where there have been several statements about this made in the field. So, um, and and I, w I hope that in the future um, more disciplines will take a look at how much, how much predatory journals have infiltrated their own work and what that means. Um, now, another study took a look at uh, how many citations there are, like how, many, how often papers in predatory journals are cited. And it seems to be, on average, a relatively no, low number, 2.25 citations per paper. Um, but the authors do give a caveat that there are some papers that have been cited hundreds and hundreds of times. 
Um, and then, of course, there's, there's a problem with, in some fields, the number of predatory journals appears to be, and it's, it's always hard to determine this, but it, it appears to be equal to or even higher than the number of legitimate journals. Um, so there was a study that looked at neurology and neuroscience journals, and that appears to be a field that has quite a high ratio of predatory to legitimate journals. Uh, another area to watch out for that uh, you guys might all take a look at is, uh, is case study journals. Yeah. Um, so, uh, And we're just going to do another little poll here because you might, you might be thinking, well, like, look at these websites. They're garbage. Look at the titles of this like effect on chickens kind of <laughs> stuff. Arctic like this, journal. this yeah. is ridiculous. Nobody's going to be fooled by that. And, uh, but we often see citations really out of context. If you saw this on, on a CV or, or on some in a reference list, in a reference list um, would you be able to identify the, uh, the potentially predatory article in here? Um, so we're actually going to do another poll just now. Um, so I'm just, just take a look at, before I run the poll, because I know it like closes down the, the screen, just take a quick look at these, um, and then I'm going, to, I'm going to put the poll up. So, all right, let's, yeah, we'll launch. Oh, we'll launch. Do, we'll oh, launch. I, oh no, manage polls, whoops. Okay, so we've launched the poll now. <laughs> um, so we'll just let you guys answer. And uh, don't don't worry too much about uh, so. okay. Just waiting for a couple more people to vote. Yeah. Okay. Good. You wanna, all yeah. right, we're going to close the poll now. Um, so we've got. Uh, the most people say they most have people no say, idea. I have no idea. There's basically an equal amounts for all the other three, um, and you wouldn't have had any idea either. Um, but it's that one. Um, oh, sorry. We've got. Oh, is it? Hmm. Okay. We'll just uh, make sure. Sorry, we're just, can you guys see? There we go. That? Okay. So it's, yeah, it's it's that one. And there's the third one. Yeah. There's really not anything about it just by looking at this information that is indicative that it is predatory. Yeah. It's in a standard format. It is relevant to the other things on this list. Yeah. Um, yeah. That's, that's it. So just from this information alone, uh, you wouldn't be able to tell. Yeah. And uh, so we've also got this, uh, here's just a sample of a Google Scholar search. And uh, Google Scholar can and does pull up predatory journals. There's that one that we just showed you um, within the, the predatory journal search list. So, or not, or the, the Google Scholar <laughs> search list. Um, so, it's yeah, so it's, it's really easy to, to not catch this. Um, so what damage can this do beyond the problems that we talked about before? Again, it can be detrimental to the reputation of, uh, of researchers or institutions. Um, there's also, if you ever realize partway through the process that you are submitting to a predatory journal and you want to remove that or not publish it or whatever, um, predatory journals will often just go ahead and publish it anyways and then ask for $400 for you to remove it and then often not remove it anyways. So, um, so there's, there's that. Um, there's also, and Orby touched on this earlier, because these guys aren't actually putting their money into a, a strong infrastructure for the journal, um, say you do publish a good paper in there, well, there's not really permanent storage. A predatory journal could be gone tomorrow. That list that I showed you before of the hijacked journals, most of them weren't there anymore. They've been removed. Um, and presumably other hijacked journals have taken their place. Um, 
And then I think one of the, the bigger things is that it undermines the credibility of, of science and scholarship. And especially in our world right now, where there's a lot of misinformation and a lot of distrust about academia in general, it's, it's not fantastic that these journals is, exist and that even legitimate scholars may be publishing in them. Um, there's also the political and financial motivations that we talked about. So um, before when I was talking about uh, people who publish in journals to do so quickly, uh, one of the things that a study found, or one of um, pharmaceutical companies will often publish in these journals um, because they're faster. And in some cases, they look at the articles and they're the ones that are just fine and they would have been accepted. But because a pharmaceutical company can make money off of it sooner, if it's published sooner, because active peer review might take, it Six might be months. a year yeah. before your paper gets out there. Well, they publish it in there and then they say, look, this is pretty good, and then it's available. Um, same with political motivations. If you're, say, writing a paper about how, I don't know, the oil sands are good for the environment or something, um, a legitimate journal isn't going to accept that, but a, a predatory journal will. And then, especially to, to laymen, um, they're not going to be able to tell the difference between a predatory publication and a non-predatory publication. Like, if they, if they don't have the... And especially if you don't read the article itself, um, to realize what its flaws may or may not be, then that's mm -hmm. so. Uh, another question that comes up from this is, well, what's what's the reach of these these articles in predatory journals? Um, so this is what we've got here is this chocolate accelerates uh, weight loss research claims it lowers cholesterol and aids sleep. Now this is another uh, Bohannon sting where he, he conducted an actual study along with a team of, of researchers who were um, actually the target of this particular study wasn't the predatory journals, um, but it had this part in it where they needed to get this, this study that they'd done, which was extremely flawed. It was tracking hundreds of variables. It had a sample size of, I think, 16 people. <laughs> um, and they just, they, they put somebody on like one group on a diet and one group not on a diet didn't pay any attention to what they did and then they said oh look these people who ate chocolate before they did this well they lost weight faster if they were on a low-carb diet um, and it's the sample size is so small and the number of variables that they were tracking was so large that something would have been found to be significant air quotes there um, and uh, so in this case, this was what they found. And because it relates to chocolate, well, that's, that's really great because it, you know, that's, that's something, that's a sexy topic that the news wants to pay attention to. Everybody wants to hear that eating chocolate is good for them. Um, and so he made a press release and put out chocolate accelerates weight loss. And it was picked up by the, uh, the mainstream media. And uh, if you want to read his report on this, you can go to the link here on io9, um, and yeah, yeah. But it was spread out through multiple multiple news sources. Um, I actually remember some of those stories coming up. That was in about 2015. So yeah, and so he was using the 24-hour news cycle and the need for this constant input mm -hmm. into news. Um, he was, th that was where the sting was yeah. focused, right? But to get it out in the first place, it had to be in a journal. And so to it was easy and quick yeah. to do that yeah. through a predatory publisher. So you yeah. couldn't have done the sting so successful. Well, probably could have. Yeah. Um, but that, the predatory journal was one. Yeah. Was one and, and then that really shows because he was contacted by reporters who asked him questions, but none of them asked questions about problems with the study, and he, he got the impression that none of them had actually read the study. Um, so all the questions that they were asked were, were meaningless questions just to sort of get a quote from the researcher. Um, so, yeah. So that's, that's sort of how far it can go if you've got a reason to make it go far. Yeah. Um, so how common 
are predatory journals? And, and the answer is we don't really know. I talked before about how in some fields um, there may be as many as 50% predatory journals or, or not. But um, in, this, in terms of the breakdown of predatory journals, uh, which is what this graph is showing. This isn't showing that like 30% of science journals are predatory. Rather, it's showing that of the the fields that uh, that predatory journals exist in, science and medicine are the two um, most common fields for them to be in, probably because they get more funding. Um, and so then it's technology, and then business, and then social sciences. And then humanities has almost no predatory journals in it, probably because they don't have any money. Yeah, there's no um, money in humanities. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, so um, health and medicine, health and medical professionals should be quite aware of this problem because they have some of the highest rates of predatory journals. We're going to switch our focus now um, away from the evils, <laughs> more to, you know, because I, I know when we gave this presentation last week at Manitoba Health, a couple of people, they just left and they were like, you guys scared the crap out of me. <laughs> and that's not our intent. Our intent is really to inform you, although if you walk away and still remember the presentation in an hour because it instilled some fear, <laughs> maybe that's okay. Um, but there are active things that you can do to avoid these. Uh, so there's a list here of, you know, the blacklist, whitelist, checklists, critical assessment, and to trust your gut. I think another one we're going to add, I've just made a note, mm -hmm. is actually read the full text. Mm -hmm. uh, straightforward, that's part of the yeah. critical assessment. But, you know, if you take one thing away, it's don't just kind of skim things or re just read the, just rely on the abstracts. Really, it's imperative now more than ever to read the full text. So I'll talk quickly through a couple of these. The first is a blacklist, and the reality is there is no one blacklist of predatory publishers. And like Maureen said, from the time that she created um, this presentation, you know, I think she started working on it in early October, um, when we went to review for uh, last week's session, some of those sites were already down. So particularly with things like um, the hijacked journals, those journals are finding and they're aware of when these um, the hijacked journals exist and they're getting those taken down right away. So there's no, it's just so fast, mm -hmm. there's not enough time to maintain a blacklist because as soon as you were on a blacklist, yeah. then they would take that site, whoever was maintaining it, would take the blacklisted site down and just create a new yeah. one. They keep like more keep coming up all the time. It's so fluid, um, yeah. It's a multi-million dollar industry. Uh, then there's the white lists, and these are things um, that, you know, are pretty secure and safe lists. Again, nothing is um, completely authoritative. Always a good option is the curated databases that places uh, that you have to pay a lot of money for. And there's a reason that we pay for um, the databases, partly because they're functional um, they're, and the functions that they provide, but also because of the authenticity of them. So an example are the Medline records, uh, like we know through PubMed. Uh, but speaking of PubMed, um, there are a couple of problems. And I mean, we're happy to discuss this in a lot of detail. And uh, oh yeah, our next session is about PubMed. The reality about PubMed is, is that the vast majority of everything in PubMed is authoritative, but there are ways that predatory publishers do sneak in, and it has to do with um, open access and about um, anything funded by a uh, by government or the big funders has to be made freely available, and it's through that, you know, sort of back door, so, so to speak, that some of these predatory journals are presenting in PubMed. So I think that just goes back. So most of the stuff in PubMed is OK, but we should always be critically appraising. Because just because something, even from the good journals and good authors, there's still junk stuff out there, mm -hmm. whether it's predatory yeah. or not. Even if it's received government funding. Yeah. yeah. So um, I, with everything, uh, we need to be critically appraising. There's also um, checklists as to how you can do critical appraisals. And so for those of you that were in our Google session, um, these are you know, the same tips that we apply to how do you assess whether a website is good, they apply here. So the University of Saskatchewan has this great tool, and on your screen it will just look like a 
lot of tiny, tiny, tiny text. And the point, so it's got a, a good column, a fair column, and a poor column. And the point here is not for you to input all of this. The point is just so that you know that this tool exists. Uh, and so depending on what you're doing, you might want to become familiar with these. And like Maureen indicated, there's no one thing that is an indicator for this is predatory or this is not. You have to take kind of all of these things and once you kind of go like, okay, well, it's poor in this area and weak in this area, weak in this area, weak. Once you've got a whole bunch of weeks or a whole bunch of pores, then that should, um, you know, that that will be your indicator. And even if it's not actively predatory at a certain point, like even if it's just a new journal that doesn't know what it's doing, like at a certain point, you maybe don't want to be using material from it or yeah. publishing in it anyways. And that's the same for if you are using evidence to inform some of your decisions, you might be going through and finding from very, you know, from great journals, great authors, great research, great funding, great, great, great everything, but their results might just say like, mm, we're just not sure about this, or yeah, we don't or, have enough data or on we it. we are sure about this, and you look at their results and you're like, why are you <laughs> sure about that? So, uh, you know, bottom line is always, if you're not, you know, don't, don't rely um, on something to base your decision if you um, have some concerns about it. Uh, so some key points to watch out for, uh, which we've already touched on, but we'll just do a quick review, are low author fees. So in open access journals, often, so we indicated that you have to, they cost money to maintain, and usually what will happen is they will ask authors for money. So it actually costs authors money to publish in those journals, and usually it's in the thousands of dollars. Mm -hmm. So 3,000, 5,000 about. Yeah, and so most researchers will build into their grant um, applications uh, the funding for that, so then that's how they can pay for it, and some institutions pay for it as well. But if it's less than $1,000, you, your spidey senses should be tingling. Uh, spelling and grammar, like we indicated, that's often a good sign the overly broad scope of the journal, so it's about science in general. Um, language that targets authors rather than readers, so real journals are actually targeted to readers and not to authors. The promise um, of rapid publication and a lack of information, I think in general, but specifically about retraction, how they handle manuscripts, and their data preservation. Uh, some other things to watch out for. Um, are, you know, is the website completely functional? Did they send you an email asking for um, uh, submissions? And um, what's the stability of this publisher? So how long has it been around? And um, is there more to the journal than just kind of a couple of pages on it? So we are still uh, having new journals added every day. So just being a brand new journal doesn't mean that it's necessarily bad or predatory, um, but it is one of the indicators that can sometimes um, be a good sign that it might be predatory. You also want to look, so all journals will always list their editorial board. Sometimes on the predatory ones, they'll, they'll list people and have some pictures that they will have just grabbed from Google. So the good ones will also include contact information and some additional information other than name and picture. Um, and you can also look at the business model. So how, where is the money coming from to actually run this? Um, and, you know, do they run a reputable conference? Uh, do they have reputable advertisers? These are all some great points. So your best bet, as always, um, is the crap test. So some of you may remember this. This is one of our, our favorite tools. And, um, and again, we'll be sending this out with, um, with the specific details, but just to go over it, now currency isn't as relevant um, when you're looking at journal articles because sometimes things that are 20 years old are still very relevant um, today. This is more for looking at websites. Or news, which we'll be talking about. Sure. And news, exactly. Um, how reliable is it? How authoritative is it? And what is their purpose and point of view? So that authority comes down to, you know, who are the editors? Who is publishing this? Who is maintaining this? And the point of view, um, again, that can be, is this targeted to readers? Or is it targeted towards authors? Because they're just in it to make some money. Okay. 
So keeping that craft test in mind, um, we're going to talk very briefly here about fake news, and we've all heard about heard a lot about this since the last election cycle um, in the United States. <coughs> My apologies. Um, so what is fake news? Well, it's it's news that contains clearly and demonstrably false information, um, and so within that there are some things that it also is not. Um, it's not satire. I've, I've posted an article from The Onion that I just really enjoy about doctors discovering the purpose of the appendix. Um, and it's not news that contains a certain political slant. Now, I might not like a website that really uh, takes a certain political stance, but that doesn't necessarily mean that it's fake news. Um, and uh, at the last election cycle, so this was these pages here, um, they're screen caps from November 18th of last year. Um, and they're, so they're just after the American uh, election. And so you've got the real news on one side, abcnews.com, and then you've got abcnews.com.co uh, on the other side. And you can see it's trying very hard to look like ABC News. It's even got the logo, which the actual ABC News website does not have. Um, and so, like, at a glance, they both, they both look pretty straightforward, but then if you take a closer look at abcnews.com.co, well, you can see, um, like, Obama signs executive order declaring that there will be a, a revote, or the, uh, that he's canceled the uh, national anthem, that it's now illegal. Um, and so there are a number of ways to, to check the validity of fake news. One is just like, keep your spidey. Does, does this sound either too terrible or too good to be true? Well, OK, that might be real, um, given the news as, as it is at the moment. But it might also not be real. Um, and so you want to double check. Uh, one of the things you can do is a Google reverse image search. That one Obama signs executive order, that showed up on about five of that abcnews.com.co's stories that I happen to see. So if the picture that's associated with the story isn't related to the story at all, that's a warning sign. Um, are any other news stories reporting on it? Where was it originally reported? These are things to pay attention to. Um, you also want to see the motives of the sites and then pay attention to things like that, .com, .co. Um, in this case, that means that the site is hosted in Colombia, uh, not the United States. Um, and there are some, as with, uh, as with the predatory journals, there are blacklists and countermeasures. So there's Simdar's list, which is basically a blacklist. It also contains, uh, uh, what's the parody sites, um, satire sites, which I was not using in the definition before. Mm -hmm. um, there's also Snopes, which is a good way to fact check individual stories. Um, they'll give you a, it's fake, it's real, it's partially fake, partially real, where did this come from? Wikipedia also maintains a list of fake news sites. It's not very extensive, but it is there, and it's some of the bigger ones. Um, an interesting thing to note, I used screen caps of abcnews.com.co and ABC News from last year, because in October, at some point, abcnews.com got taken down. So that fake news site is no longer around, but there are presumably other fake news sites that have cropped up. Mm -hmm. um, so the real thing, none of these lists are going to keep up to date in the way that you might need them to or you might want them to. Um, so you want to be paying attention to just, just pay attention as you're reading. Don't let it filter in as background information. Um, maintain that critical assessment. And uh, uh, doing the crap test. So, uh, in turn, some of we've just got a question about the reverse image search. If you go to images.google.com um, and you just, if if you've got the, well, we can we'll send out when we send out the slides, we can send yeah. out the instructions on how to do but that. But basically, you can drag images into the Google search bar, and it'll do a reverse image search where it looks for where this image was found. Um, so that's actually all we have. Oh, okay, great. So, yeah. Perfect timing. So um, if we have any more questions, uh, so this is our contact information. We will be sending out the slides. 
we will be sending out a handout that has the details of the crap test on it, as well as um, the sort of key things to watch out for in terms of uh, checking for predatory journals. Um, so we'll stick around for questions for a while. I don't think anybody has the webinar software after us. So um, I know we're basically out of time, but we'll stick around for a bit longer. Yeah, and just kind of with the, um, you know, the final caveat of we really want to make sure that you are aware that this is an issue and that if you are getting that push, particularly to your email, that you're really, like Maureen seems to be getting a lot <laughs> and I I don't know if my spam filter, is she's just more desirable. I get less at the University of Manitoba. Most of those are taken from my University of Alberta email, oh, okay. which is uh, technically run through Gmail, not through, uh, through Outlook, so that might make a difference. Right. Um, but if you're getting a lot of those, we really just want you to be aware, and also that we can help in this process. So if ever, uh, you know, it was funny, I came across an article and I came to Maureen and I said, like, I am sure this thing is predatory. <laughs> and it took us about, I don't know, like 15 minutes to go through and it turns out it was not predatory at all. It was just like a wonky looking website mm -hmm. with um, a title and abstract written by mathematicians. So it was not <laughs> readable in the least. Um, but if you ever come across anything like that, you are welcome to send it to us and just say like, hey, can you look into this a little bit for us? Mm -hmm. And not that we're perfect exports, experts and that we won't ever be fooled, but that uh, this is part of our job is to yeah. um, critique and analyze these things. Yeah. But it is a good idea just in general to, to be wary about what you're reading and yeah, and critically really, appraise everything, yeah. read the full text. Yeah, and really if it sounds if it sounds wonky, it probably, probably is, is, but even if it's not, that doesn't mean it's good. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and we do have an assessment survey which which we hope you'll you'll Yeah, fill we'll send out the link for that. Yeah. So again, thank you so so much for coming and you can um, always follow up with questions or like Maureen indicated, we'll be online for a few more minutes. Yeah. But Thanks we'll, for coming. We'll probably mute ourselves now okay. until. Um, was that it? Sorry. No, because maybe.